talking about promises, promises, promises. Now, the Lord's made us a lot of promises in His Word. This is what, in Second Peter chapter 1, this is what Peter writes. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start at verse 1 again, then we'll get down to 4. But it says, this letter is from Simon Peter. We all know him, we've heard about him, we've read about him. A slave or a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing you, uh, to you who share the same precious faith that we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and the fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. And it says, by His divine power, He's given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him. Talking about Jesus, the one who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because his glory of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These promises, these are the promises that enable you to share in His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So, we've been talking about it for several weeks here, about all the promises that the Lord has given us. Somebody who had a lot more time than I do sat down and looked at the Word and, and counted them all up. There's more than one person that has this same count. It's 3,573 promises in the Bible that apply to us. That's 3,573 promises that apply to us. That's a whole lot of promises. And I promise you, we're not going to talk about every one of them. <laughs> but we are going to look at some of them. Let's pray and we'll get into the Word. Father, thank you again for today, for, for just your presence. And Lord, what we're asking today is that you would just come into this place, into our lives, into our situations as messed up as some of them might be. Lord, you did not put any limitations on what you would do in our lives. But you said that you would meet us where we were. You said that if we would draw near to you, you'd draw near to us. And that's a promise that we can count on. And I thank you for already being here. But I, do, I just pray that you would come in the fullness of the Holy Spirit today. And God, to truly, truly, let us be able to feel just a tangible presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. That you'd wrap your arms around those who are broken hearted. That you would strengthen those who are physically weak and those who could not be here. We pray for Joel this morning. We pray for, for others who are sick at home today and maybe couldn't be here. But Lord, you have met every need that we have. You said that you took those stripes upon your back for our healing. Thank you for that. Just let every person in this place, though, feel a tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why we came here. And we don't, want to just, we don't want to just come in and do church. God, we want to hear from you. We want to feel you. We want to experience you. So would you just come into this place right now? And we thank you, God, for speaking to us through your word and speaking to us through the power of the Holy Spirit today. But Lord, thank you in advance for the great things you're going to do and we give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. As I said earlier, I do feel, I, I, I cannot explain it, words lack. <laughs> but ever since the first of the year, I, I always pray, you know, a month or so before the first of the year, and say, God, what, what is it you want to do this year in us as individuals, as a corporate body of believers? And I just sensed, uh, it was like an anticipation. God's building up to do something, and I do believe that we are headed in a great direction, and I do believe the devil's fighting that. And so we need to, we need to not be discouraged, but we need to be encouraged. Amen? Because uh, the de if the devil's fighting what's going on, that means it's got to be good. Amen? So let's keep praying, let's keep, keep on keeping on, and um, we're going to stand on his promises. I took the word promise, made an acrostic out of it, so that's what we've been looking at. There's so many things in the Word, and either we don't know them, and to know them, we've got to understand the Word. We've got to read our Word. Uh, 
you know, the thing is, this is, this is a, a, a manual, okay? So many times we'll go get something new, uh, get a new piece of, of equipment, get a new car, get, a, get something new, and the first thing we'll do, I've seen so many people, they'll go get a new car, and they'll take that manual in the house with them, take it out of the car, take it in the house, and they're just reading about all the stuff that this new car will do. You won't believe what this thing will do. This is the manual for this thing right here. And so many times we neglect to read it. And we don't know all the things that we can do, amen, through Christ, because He's going to strengthen us. But we don't understand what's going on in our lives. Sometimes we, don't, we get discouraged and, and, and we don't know why and we don't understand all the things that are going on because we have not read our manual my challenge to you is get in your manual. I don't care how it is. Amen? I don't care if you, you know, there's lots of places online you can sign up and get a, a daily email with your Bible in it. Uh, ever since the first of this year, I've been listening to a daily audio Bible um, just to refresh myself. I've been through this thing. I have read, and I'm not tooting my horn. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you something here. I've, I have read through... I'm talking about starting at the, at the, in the beginning and going to the last amen at least six or eight times. I'm talking about starting in the beginning, not stopping until I get all the way to the end of Revelation. At least that many times. I do other things as far as reading and studying and all that kind of stuff, and I'm still finding new stuff in there. I mean, it's like, how could I have missed this the first six or eight times I've done this thing? Uh, I, I, you know, I'm just, my challenge to you is get in here and find that promise. Because here's the thing, all of us deal with stuff. All of us have, have got our plates full. I, I don't, even in, in my time on this earth, which will soon be 50 years, I have not seen a time when people had more stuff going on than, than any other time that I've experienced it. Everybody's plates full. Everybody's got more than they can handle. Everybody's just, just up to here with stuff. And the only way that we're going to be able to succeed in life, the only way that we are going to be able to live a successful Christian life is to get in here and find out what God's got planned for us. Find out all the things that we can do. Find out that I can do all things because He's going to strengthen me. Find out that I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I am more than a conqueror through Him because He loved me. I'm telling you, there's a promise for anything you're dealing with. Anything that's going on in your life is covered right here. This thing is real life. Because if it wasn't, some of this stuff would have been left out. Amen? I mean, you, wanna, you want some interesting reading. You get in there and find out some stuff. I mean, it's better than a soap opera. Amen? <laughs> some of this stuff. That's what lets me know this Bible is real. Because otherwise, it would have been all peaches and cream, and nobody would have ever had anything go wrong. We are just like these people. We're striving to get close to God, striving to live a successful Christian life and striving to do what God wants us to do. And the only way we can do it is if we get in here and find a promise. Stand on that promise. Amen? So, we started out with the promises. The P is peace of mind and peace of heart. Jesus said it in John chapter 14, 27. It is one that you can underline. I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is the, a gift that the world cannot give you. I don't care where you look. I don't care where you're trying to find it. It ain't going to happen in the world. People are look, looking for it through relationships. They're looking for it in all kinds of different ways. It's not going to come like the Lord can give it. So don't be troubled or be afraid. Sometimes we just need that right there to know that the Lord can give us peace of mind, peace of heart, one phone call, one text, one Facebook message, one email, and all of a sudden, your peace is gone. It's one of the most fragile things that we have. But you know what? The Lord has an endless supply. The only thing that we got to do is stay concentrated on Him. Isaiah 26, 3, He will keep in perfect peace whose trust is in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. So if we will just forget about all this junk that's going on sometimes and concentrate on the Lord, we're going to have that peace that He says surpasses all understanding the hearts rest for your soul we are so wore out i talk to people and I'm, I'm just tired and if it was all about just being physically tired we could sleep in one day and we'd be fixed 
Or if it was just about stress, we could get away from it all, take a vacation, come back, and hallelujah, it would all be better. But so many times, we're more stressed out coming back from a vacation than we are when we left because we got all that junk piled up that we didn't do the, the time we were gone. So, the Lord says that He can give us rest for our soul that goes beyond anything. He tells us all the things we can do. If you haven't been here, get those messages. Number uh, The O is an opportunity to serve. We've all been given a gift. The Bible's very, very clear on that. Each one of us has a gift that has been given to us from God to serve the body of Christ. It says, so serve one another well. And what we do sometimes is we use our gifts and our talents. It's all about us. We're serving ourselves. We're serving some company. And we don't give anything to the Lord. We don't give anything to the body of Christ. If we want to have, a, have a, a really, really successful life, find out what your gift is and use it to serve the body of Christ. Amen? Whatever it is. So, now, this is new stuff. Mercy and our time of need. Probably one of the most overlooked promises in the Word of God. Why? Because we don't really understand mercy. And we don't really understand grace. Now, grace, you know, we, we, we're quick. Boy, that's the unmerited favor of God. I didn't deserve it, but God gave it to me. But what is mercy and grace in our life? And this is what, um, what the writer of Hebrews says here, chapter 4, verse 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. In other words, that we might enter in to His presence. Now, that was something that they could not do in the Old Testament. You couldn't get to the Holy of Holies. You couldn't enter in. The only person that could do that was the, the high priest, and he could only do that one time a year. The rest of the time, you were just coming in, and you were giving sacrifices, and you were giving offerings, and you were paying the price for sin, but you couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies. Whenever Jesus died on that cross, it tells us in the Word, that the, the big heavy curtain, the veil between the outer court and the inner court where the Holy of Holies was, it was torn from the top to the bottom. Signifying that God Himself, it wasn't torn from the bottom to the top, it was torn from the top to the bottom. Signifying that God had opened access to His throne. Where He sits on what seat? The mercy seat. It tells us that back in the tabernacle times that whenever somebody was coming in and, and that they could go to the altar and cling to the horn of the altar if they needed mercy. If they had killed somebody or something and they were repenting, they could run in there and grab onto the horn of the altar so that they might receive mercy. And God tells us that even though we are sinful people, <gasps> what? Aren't we all Christians? Aren't we all perfect? Some people think that. It's so amazing to me. I used to be one of these. I was a firm believer. That people really, really, way down deep were good. And sin just came in and messed it all up. And that way down deep, everybody was good. In my time... Here on this earth, I've come to believe just the opposite. People are really mean. <laughs> and downright ugly sometimes. And it's only when the Lord comes in and does something. I mean, we, we come in here sometimes in church world, when, when, we, when we come to know the Lord and we get saved, all of a sudden we think we have become perfect. And, and we got all of us. It's a, it's, it's a sin that we've got. Everybody's is not the same. So sometimes we come in and we judge somebody else's so much worse than ours. I mean, you know, if somebody's doing something just terribly, terribly wrong, oh, we will stand back and we'll put them. I cannot believe what they're doing over there. And you know, our sin looks so teeny, tiny, and small compared to their sin. It's huge. But mine's a little bitty. And then we get judgmental about things. And what, what that breeds is, sometimes in church world, what we do is we all come in and we paint on this face like we're perfect too. I haven't missed it. I haven't done anything wrong. I mean, look at what you're doing. It's all kinds of wrong. 
But I only only thing I did was go to the buffet and pig out. <laughs> Careful, Bill. <laughs> Oh, but they're gossiping. Only thing I did was just a little, little bit of gluttony. Jesus said, you're, you're looking at your brother and you're seeing the little speck in their eye and what you're having to do is look around that telephone pole sticking out of your own. And I'm telling y'all, I am so absolutely fed up with religion. Pretending like we come in here and, and we're all perfect and, and, and that everything is a okay with me instead of coming in and saying, you know, I'm broke. Not broke as far as money, but I'm broken. Why can't we do that? Why can't we come in and say, I need y'all to pray for me? Because we're afraid of being judged. Because we're afraid that all the people that look like they're perfect will judge me about my sin. And when the body of Christ learns that, we're going to be unstoppable. When we know what mercy is, when we understand what grace is all about, that we are all sinners, that we are all struggling with something. It might seem small. It might be a something little, but it's still... If we look at the, at the Bible, look at what the Word of God says, and it's in so many different places... Where Paul in Romans chapter 5, he says that all have sinned and, and missed it. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 3, he says, uh, uh, I'm under the power of sin. In, in Romans chapter 6, he says, I'm enslaved to sin. And so many times we think about sin on a, on a, on a singular level. Oh, I did something and that was a sin. But in, in John chapter 1 whenever John is, is seeing Jesus for the first time, and he says, Behold the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. That's plural. Sin's this big thing out here. That it doesn't matter what we've done, it all falls into this big thing. It's sin. And if you look into the original language which sometimes it brings such clarity, and this is one of those times. The word in all of those instances is the word harmatia. And harmatia, if you look it up and feel free to, it's H-A-R-M-A-R-E-R-T-I-A. -E -E <laughs> T -I -A. And the word harmatia means to miss the mark. fact is, it's related to archery in some of the Old English. Harmatia means to miss the mark. And I don't care how good an archer you are, I don't care how good you are at shooting a rifle, every now and then you're going to squeeze one off when you weren't expecting it, and you're going to miss the mark. Just a little sideline. I know this is big hunting country. People like to bow hunt and stuff. Mark, what, what, what's a, a, a pretty good range on a, on, a, on a shot at a deer? About 30 yards. I was just looking up some stuff about harmatia and how it's related to archery. Back in the Middle Ages, you know, this is like 13, 1400s, 1200s in there, there were professional archers that would hire themselves out basically as mercenaries and their effective range in several places is written down and recorded as up to 400 yards. With a long bow. A long bow. Not a compound bow. Not, no sights. Fact is, they were talking about there was, there was this one particular war where this fellow was hit from several hundred yards away. He had on armor. It went through the armor, through his leg, through his saddle, and killed his horse. I mean, these were some two-fisted whopper of a bow. Fact is, and, and I even wrote down the year. You, you can trust me, but if you want to go look it up. In uh, 1542, King Henry VIII set the minimum distance of the, of the militia, the average person in that, in that kingdom, for their practice with a bow was 220 yards. 
That's just the average person. These other professional guys were the ones that were shooting 400 yards. And that's two football fields in the end zones. Amen? And so what would happen is, they would set their targets up. Well, how many of you know it's hard to see an arrow at 220 yards? And so what they would do is they'd, they'd build these dugouts, and they'd have somebody downrange, and if they missed, they would holler out, Harmatia! You missed the mark. In literature, and Kathy probably knows this, in literature, Harmatia is the fatal flaw in a hero or heroine. It's that that one something that keeps them from being absolutely perfect. They're one weak link, they're Achilles heel, if you will. Harmatia is the word that's related to that in literature and drama. In other words, that they have this fatal flaw. They missed the mark. You probably figured out where I'm heading. We, we have a fatal flaw. Because sin is this big pluralistic thing that just by being born into humankind, we have hanging over our heads. Even if we, if we were born on a deserted island, lived by ourselves, we still would have missed the mark because humankind missed it all the way back with Adam and Eve. We can't get there. We cannot achieve it. We, we can't get to heaven. We, we've all got this, Paul says, uh, that we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. That, that we have this, that, that Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. It, the world didn't sin. This earth itself didn't sin. Mankind sinned and brought a curse on it. We've all missed the mark. And what I'm telling you is there's none of us that's perfect. And being a believer does not mean that we have reached perfection. It simply means that we have reached a point of forgiveness with God. And what I'm telling you here is we all need mercy. And we all need grace. And thank God there's so much bigger than we give it credit for. Lamentations chapter 3, Jeremiah's writing, and he says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. When does that mean it ends? Never. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every morning. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. This is the Lord speaking about those who believe in Him. And, and He says, And I'll forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Is that not awesome? See, some people view God as this big, iron-fisted disciplinary, and He's just waiting for us to mess up where He can send us to hell. And it's the total opposite. The fact is, hell was not even created for us, for people. It tells us in the Old Testament that hell had to increase its size because of the sinfulness of man. It was meant to be a holding place for the demons and the devils that rebelled with Satan against God. It was never meant for a human person to be there. But hell had to, had to make itself bigger because of the sinfulness of man. I'm just telling you, this morning, we need to get real. And quit having religion. And have a relationship with God. And have a relationship with each other. This ought to be the safest place that you come into. That you can come in and say, hey, I missed the mark. I blew it. Would you pray with me? Not judge me. Not, not come in and give some condescension. Not come in and give me a bunch of ways that I can do what I need to do and not do. Would you just pray with me? Because God's already said, I will not ever remember it again. In another place, He says, I'm going to put your sin as far as the east is from the west. Throw it into the sea of forgetfulness. Never to be remembered again. 
Is that not awesome? And how much opposite are we? Somebody does something wrong and we, boy, we are quick to bring that up. You remember that time when you... We need to be as forgetful as God. I don't have this written down for you, Chad, I don't think. Luke chapter 6, I believe it is. This is what the Lord says. Luke chapter 6, verse 3. Verse 30. <laughs> Excuse me. Maybe I ought to put my glasses on. <laughs> verse 30. <laughs> Give to anyone who asks. But that stuff's mine. The Lord says, give to anybody ask you. He didn't say you had to give away the whole farm. But we need to try to make a difference in our world. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you'd like them to do unto you. And if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit? Credit? What are we talking about here? What's the credit thing about? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get any credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get any credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. So then he explains it. And he says, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven. That's where we're getting the credit. My reward from heaven. I, I'm not expecting to get reward here. I'm expecting to get a reward in heaven. It says then your reward in heaven will be great. And you'll truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is... Oh, oh wait. This kind of explains it all. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked just like you were and just like I was there was a time in my life when I didn't give God the time of day you will never be more like your heavenly father than when you're giving and loving and you're never more like the devil when you're hateful and stingy period so he says we'll go back up here to do unto them like you'd like them to do unto you. Because here's the thing. He says, if somebody's stealing, don't stop them, all this kind of stuff. And w w sometimes it doesn't compute till you bring it down to terms. Somebody's trying to steal my coat. Dad gummit, that's my coat. I paid for that thing. I, 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 I need my coat. Because I might be cold. It's my coat. Even though it says Miss Imp. <laughs> But he says, do unto others as you'd have them to do unto you. Well, what do you mean? If you were cold, would you want a coat? What, what about if that was your kid? What about if that was your kid? Would you want somebody to give them a coat or give them a hard time? Do unto others as you would have them. Because see, it makes a difference when there's something behind it somebody's cold i'll give them my coat but we we puff up and we say no i i, I this is my coat it's my stuff i it's mine 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 i would lick it but miss emma wouldn't like that <laughs> so when you think about it with an explanation behind it is so much different as i told you last week there's been times when I've seen that Jesus was hungry and I gave him a cheeseburger. Now somebody come up and try to steal my cheeseburger, we might have to have a talk. But that's what he's saying. If somebody comes up and gets it, let them have it. Because you don't know the backstory. You don't know what's going on in their life. Let them have the cheeseburger. They make more, I promise you. We can go buy a ton of them right now. And so what I'm telling you is, 
Sometimes we don't understand the whole thing until we get the backstory. And what I'm telling you, sometimes all people need in this world is some mercy. And allowing the Lord to work through us. And all we've got to do to get it is ask. Is that not awesome? We don't even have to take it. All we've got to do to get mercy is ask. Because he said if we'll come boldly before the throne of grace and, and, and plead for mercy, that we're going to receive it. The Lord's going to give us that mercy. He's going to forget about all the things that we have against us. He's not going to throw it up to us and say, you remember that time, you old naughty rascal, you. He's going to say, come here, son. Come here, daughter. Let me give you a hug because I done forgot about all that junk. That's one of the greatest promises there is in that word. And he has given it to us freely so that we can understand. See, we've all missed the mark. That word harmatia, we've all missed the mark. And we've all got a fatal flaw. But God's got the answer to the fatal flaw. And he will do away with it. It's like it never happened. All we got to do is stand on his promise and come boldly not just slip in, not just ease in there like, you know, trying to sneak in. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you might receive mercy in your time of need. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you say, Brother Philip, I'm tired of the junk, tired of the religion. I don't want to be judged, but I want mercy. If that's you today and you say, Brother Philip, I'm going to come boldly before the throne of grace and I am going to ask God for mercy because this is my time of need. I've blown it. I've missed the mark. I've got that fatal flaw, but I want to make it right. I want God to forget it and never remember it again. If that's you and you say, I need to get rid of my junk and I need mercy, God. I want to pray with you, so would you slip your hand up? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You're just getting things right with God. You're just squaring it up with God. Yes, I see those hands. You can just slip them up and back down. Yes. And just say, God, I need your mercy today because I have missed the mark. And we all do. We all need that. It might not be that you need it today, but I guarantee you we all need that from time to time. God, I missed it. And I'm sorry. If you raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to mean it. You might need to add some things to it, but just in your own way. I'm going to lead us, but you just pray in your own way and just say, Dear God, I, I, I missed it. I blew it. I was trying to hit the target. I was trying to be right there. And I missed it. Just like the Apostle Paul says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. Oh, wretched person that I am. God doesn't want us beating ourselves up, but He wants us to run boldly to that throne of grace and just say, dear God, I missed the mark. I blew it. Would you forgive me? Would you come in like maybe you did all that time ago? You might be praying this prayer for the first time or it might be the 10,000th time. It don't matter. God, I blew it. I need your mercy. Would you help me? I, I don't want to find myself here again, but that's where I'm at. So would you forgive all those things that I've done that would displease you, all those things that, that I didn't do what I knew I was supposed to? I, I drew that bow and I, and I thought I had it sided in, but I missed the mark. I need your mercy. I need your grace in my life. Would you please allow that to flow through me that I can do unto others as you have done unto me? God, let your mercy, let your grace be, be such a, 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 an increase in my life that I can't help but let it flow out to others. It's what you were telling us to do in Luke chapter 6. So Lord, I thank you 
for saving me. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for never-ending mercy and grace in my life. Thank you for securing my future. Thank you for, for giving me a, a present that is, has promise. And I thank you for all the great things that you've got in store. And I thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.